In today's show, it's the first ADP battle of draft season. I'm joined by Dan Besbris, Daniel Besbris Jr. of Sports Ethos, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. ADP battle time. If you don't know what these are, it's me and another fantasy analyst and I pick a random ADP number. Hey, we're sitting at pick 20. These two guys on the board, who do you take? And it's sort of like a debate show. I, you know, try to play a little bit more of an asshole and pick the, the other guy's arguments apart. They do it to me. And basically, we talk about why we would do this, why we wouldn't do that, where you would take this guy, when it makes sense to do it. And as a lot of this stuff, I might pretend to be an asshole and pick an argument apart, as I say all the time. And when you get between 50 and 70 and 80 and 110, they're so close in value that little tiny things can change things and and team build and need and scarcity, which we did the video on earlier today, can change things a lot. But I think it gives you an idea to see certain analysts that are higher or lower on other players compared to where I am, their reasons, their arguments for it. And then you make up your own mind. It's not about just blindly following what I say. I try to tell you what I think and the reasons behind it. They'll do the same. You work out those reasons. You think about it. You make your own decisions. That's how all of this stuff works. I'm going to find out how it all works as I bring in the big fella, Dan Besbris. We'll get him in in a second. Should we do it? Yeah. Warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. All right, here he is. The big fella is back with us. It is, of course, Daniel Besbris Jr. of Sports Ethos Fantasy NBA today. Danny, welcome back. Hey, what's happening, Josh? Good to be here. It's good to have you here. We've had you here, I think, a couple of times in the preseason already, or at least once, I know that. And now we're here to do our annual tradition of ADP battles. If you are watching this on YouTube, don't freak out about the board of names behind Dan. They are from about three years ago. And no, we're not drafting, I think, Brooke Lopez in round seven or whatever it is on that board. Don't freak out. Don't panic. Don't try to zoom in and look at details. I implore you, just look at his sexy head. That's all you need to look at. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, and that'll get, that'll get you through thing the thing upside down. I need to flip it upside down uh, so people know it's just like... People will start so holding their phones upside down. They'll hold their phones up and zoom in. Go, it's, it's a secret code. It's a secret code. It's reverse order. This is what they're trying. They're trying to tell us, but they're not trying to tell us. Anyway, yeah, not that. We're doing ADP battles. I gave the premise at the start, Dan. You know the premise. I give a phantom, random, imaginary um, draft pick. I put two players up and we go, who are we going to pick? And that's as simple as that. Then we put our arguments out. We describe why we do it. We talk about why we wouldn't do it. All that sort of stuff. It's great. We're going to go through five of them today. The first one is an interesting one. I think it's almost a tradition that we have to have you on and we have to talk about Luka Doncic because we know that you're very heavily into nine-cat roto leagues and Doncic's value is reduced there. So we're sitting at pick 12. And let's say the league is filled with 11 other Dan Bresbrises and Luka Doncic is available at pick 12. Tyrese Halliburton is still there at pick 12 as well because in some drafts he falls to ADP of 16. This is highly hypothetical because Luka really doesn't fall here, but I just want to get your thought on it. If you had to pick between these two, Halliburton and Doncic, who are you taking? Well, first of all, heaven help us all if there are 12 Dan (laughs) Bresbrises in any room together or on the planet together. Uh, but I'm actually going Tyrese Halliburton there. And again, some of that is the Roto side because I do pay close attention to both percentages and turnovers. And in head to head, you can on a week to week basis, you might still win field goal or free throw percent. Even if you have a guy on your team, who's not as good at it. Whereas in Roto, it's going to compile over the course of the year. You're not going to just have like a lucky six months. If someone's not great and they weigh heavily on a category, it's going to add up. And right now, Halliburton doesn't really weigh heavily on anything. Luca's going to get you more counting stats, but Halliburton in Roto, I think, is going to do more good than you see from Luca kind of on the negative side of it. So, you know, the, the short answer is this one might be settings dependent 
Uh, but certainly for a roto guy like me, I'm I, I'd lean pretty hard to Halliburton there. Yeah, look, the, the thing that no, I just did a video on this earlier today is talking about, and this is why, Luca, when you just strictly look at mathematical formulas and you do include turnovers in that, like he'll come out as like the 30th best player. I remember debating with someone in the comments of one of my videos, always a great idea, talking about how <laughs> they, they would take Robert Williams ahead of Luka Doncic in the middle of the second round. I wouldn't touch Luka till round three. And I go, well, that's, yeah, that's, you're just strictly basing that, that on the number. And when the fact that is, if you want points and assists, Dan, you, you just can't get them. Uh, early on and Halliburton and you, I've not heard you talk about this before is that in a rotor league you often find yourself um, yeah, sort of soft punting points because you target the percentages and some of the defensive stats which often leads to um, that non-bulk amount of points and it can be and if you don't get them early like if you do get Halliburton in round one at pick 12 in this situation it can be really hard to be you know getting a 10 or an 11 in the points category because all the bulk scorers they're gone and Luke is one of those bulk scorers, and he's like he might average thirty points a game this season, and that that, that value to me is so important because you can't it's you can't make that up later on really. Yeah, I mean you're right. I, I don't I don't actually disagree on that point. Um, my my weird soft punt points thing in roto is not usually by design, but it is because I do attack percentages pretty hard. I find them to be. Uh, I'm going to use the word soft again here, but I, I find the percentages, at least in Roto, to be the softest category. There's just a lot of easy ways to win it. All you have to do is not take someone who's crushing either of them, and you'll probably be top three in both, which is pretty cool uh, when you think about how hard it is to win some of the other categories because everybody is attacking those. So, uh, you know, I'll end up with one or two guys on my team that tend to be okay at scoring by midseason. I might trade those guys away, for someone that can get me more Roto points back in another category in head to head, I would have a much harder time going with Halliburton here. I still might, but it would be really close in a way that in Roto Halliburton's got like kind of head and shoulders for me on this one. Cause he really does help in both, especially to get field goal percent from a guard like that. Last thing on this one, I don't need to talk about Doncic too much, but just on the Halliburton. So I am going to talk Halliburton definitely when we get Zach Hanshu on because he is uh, as yeah, as got him kind of high. <laughs> he is as bricked up as anybody is about Tyrese Halliburton. So we're going to talk about that in a, in a couple of days' time. But are you concerned? And I guess Roto Games Cup, it's not as big of an issue about the Pacers really leaning into a tank and him not playing. You know, in, I'm not personally because again they were tanking last season and he played for 36 minutes a night. But is that, does that come into your calculations at all? It's in there a little bit. I, you know, I don't know if he gets to 77 games. I think that's where he was at last year. That's a really huge number for someone you're going to build your franchise around, but even 72, 74 is still a good deal more than league average these days. So you can probably chalk him up as a play most of the time kind of guy. Yeah. I don't think you're know, projecting anyone to play 77 games really is the right way to go because you know, it's, it's, it's you you where's the um where's the up the, the positive benefit of that like yeah you know, if i project for 77 they might go over it like, probably not like the chances of going it's like a 10 90 proposition like if i'm going to project someone i want it to at least be like a 60 40 or a 50 50 so the, the chances of going over 77 or 78 games is so so slim and there's just way more downside risk built into that Whereas the upside yeah, risk, nobody it's, does just, it it's just not there. Like, it's, yeah, it's not there. Like, and that's, we talk about as well, you're drafting at absolute ceiling. Well, if everything happens and goes right, then sure, that, that makes sense. But yeah, if it doesn't, yeah, you, you're in real trouble. There's no, there's no ability. You're not balancing in the middle. You, you've hit at the top and you hope it sticks. But if something goes wrong, then you could be in real trouble. We've got more ADP battles to talk about in a sec, Dan, before I do that. I'm going to tell the fine folks watching, listening to this podcast about Bilt Bar. They know about Bilt Bar. It's the best tasting protein bar ever. And the fine... Absolute protein bar boffins over at Bilt Bar. I've come up with a great new flavor. It is delicious, indulgent cookie dough. Dan, would you say that you indulge in cookie dough or do you just eat it? <laughs> is it? Is it something you indulge in? I don't know what I do with it. I might build a hut out of it. Cookie dough is something that is very, um, I will say strictly, it's not the right word, very typically American. It's not a big thing over here, although I do love cookie dough flavored things. Or it's not. It's just something that's sort of just permeating through the wood. And it's permeated through these built bar puffs as well. They are low in Josh, calories. Can I, ruin, can I ruin your ad for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So I was told as a kid that cookie dough had raw egg in it. And so I wasn't supposed to eat it. I don't think that's like cookie dough flavor doesn't, but actual cookie dough does. So I was always like weird hypochondriac child that I was, I guess. I was weirdly afraid of getting salmonella from cookie dough, so I didn't really get into it that much. But the fl it smells delicious. I know people love us talking about ads, but is, is raw egg actually like 
bad. I know, like, yeah, isn't isn't a whiskey sour? Doesn't it have that raw egg in it? I just, yeah, I, and then people make blender. They put it in blenders for like protein shakes and stuff. I don't know. I like. Anyway, I, I, everyone's lying to eggs. us. Everyone's lying to us apart from Bilt Bar because they are low calorie, low carb, low <laughs> fat, low sugar, but high in protein. Whether you're coming back from the gym, whether you just want a healthy treat. Built Bar is the option. So go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKEDON15. That'll save you 15% off your order. And like Dan Besbris, Built Bar is built different. Next one, Danny, we're going to go to pick 30. And this is, again, leaning into your value of um, old men, your value of Roto. And that is uh, old mate Christopher Paul. At pick number 30, it's Chris Paul versus the big fella himself, Zion Williamson. So... The, I guess, what's the argument here? I'll start my argument on Zion. I think he's really good. And I think he's going to just, in head-to-head leagues, which is most of what I'm talking about, you want to blow up strengths. You want to just go, what are my big strengths here? Like, if Zion, Zion could average 30 points a game, literally, and do it at 64% shooting. Like, that's not, it sounds outrageous, but if he did it, you wouldn't go, wow, that came out of nowhere. And yeah, maybe he gets eight rebounds and four assists and maybe the college defense stats. It doesn't matter. Those other numbers are just so unbelievably big that I I love that value. And he's healthy at the moment. Sure, he might get hurt later on. But Chris Paul, for me, on the other hand, he's 37. He's said, screw it, I'm not taking threes anymore. Much like my earlier point, his scoring is one of the lowest out of the projected top, say, 30 players or so. It's really low. And if you don't get it, you can't compete really in that points category, which might be fine. Um, and then there's just general terrible vibes in Phoenix at the moment. I don't know what's going on over there. In general, I will take Zion over Chris Paul. It's not it's not that big a deal to me. It's not it's not that different to me. Because again, it's just going to depend on your build. But I guess I wanted to say like, how are you concerned about the cliff coming for Chris Paul? No, I mean, cliff pun unintended coming for Chris Paul, and or are you just well done. are you more worried about Zion? So uh, I will say I am worried about the vibes in Phoenix. That that wasn't something that was in the the calculus when I started to put my board together. It Dan, the, those the, vibes. What, what if, what's the opposite of immaculate? Like you have immaculate vibes, and there's what shit stain vibe or whatever's going on in Phoenix. Yeah. It's just horrendous. It's outhouse style out there. <laughs> Everything has come apart. Uh, Jay Crowder wants out uh, when he's supposed to be like the team build guy. Um, DeAndre Ayton was held hostage at his press conference, whatever that was two days ago. It's um, it's rough. Like if anybody can survive it, it's Chris Paul because he's very much kind of in his own headspace. Uh, but yeah, it does worry me a bit just about the team as a whole. You just you don't want to bet on a team where nobody feels good about what's going on. That said, one of the things that I do feel okay about with Chris Paul that most people don't is the age factor because he's almost defying it. He's gotten healthier over the last three years after some downtime in Houston and even at the end of his Clippers tenure, where well, everybody's like, oh, he missed 17 games last year. Yeah, he missed him because he busted his hand and actually came back two weeks early from that injury. So it could have been a lot worse. It hasn't been the nagging hamstring. That was it for him for a long time. It was always a hammy, hammy after hammy. First it was the left, then he favored it, and it was the right. So that doesn't bother me that much. Everybody knows I love Chris Paul. Um, so I would go him over Zion here in a vacuum in basically any format. What I do want to warn listeners of, and and you you know everybody knows me as the old man guy. You can't take an old man at every pick because then you're doing kind of what I've preached against. Like you're building a team that's now weak in the same few categories the whole way through. There has to be some balance to it, even on the roto side. Like if I went Halliburton first. I probably wouldn't go Chris Paul third because they're the same player just separated by 15 years of age. Like they're the same fantasy stat set. The other thing is, is taking older guys, there is value in it, but we talked about, yeah, the upside proposition, like where do they get better? Like it it doesn't happen. Like that's, that's the 1% outlier of someone who gets better at that age and starts improving significantly on, on that value. So you got their projection and what they did. Most likely you're dropping 5% off what they did last season, but it's more likely they have a 20% reduction in production than a 10% increase. Like that's just at 37, it's not likely. And I feel like sometimes when, when the cliff hits, like it's bad, like it's, it's, it's bad. You lose a step, you get those three years ago, Dan, people were like, I'm never drafting Chris Paul, man. He's always injured. He's always hurt. And now, you know, that, that opinion's changed, but, he could get hurt again, and healing does take longer with muscles, not with bones, because that's bones of bones. But muscles do take longer to heal as you get older. So you know, there's 
there, this, there is limited upside. And you're right, you don't want to stack them all together because then where does your team actually get, get blow up from? Like, how does it get that massive outlier, big production that came out of nowhere? It just, you can't find it in, in those sort of players, I don't believe, anyway. No, and if you have, like, seven guys who are all really good at percentages, you can then afford to mm-hmm. do some of the other stuff. It's all a team build thing here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the one thing I really wanted to sort of plant my flag on is that Chris Paul isn't this injury-prone guy that people are still... And, and so that's the other point there, and, and I know we got to move on to the next one, but, like, he's not going to get better. That's true, but he's still getting picked well back of where he has been. So okay. if the erosion is smaller than the market seems to think it's going to be, that's where you create that little pocket of value, and that's kind of the old man plan if you like pared it down to one half sentence, my, my, my risk, yeah, I'll get onto the next one. I said, my risk with it is, is, is it's true. It's, it's small erosions, but the only sort of player who's had those small erosions really in the past has been, or well, yeah, in the last 10 years is, is LeBron. Who's you know, yeah. that same age, but then yeah, LaMarcus Aldridge was good. Then dreadful. Blake Griffin, dreadful. Paul Millsap, dreadful. DeAndre Jordan, useless. Like these players that just Darren Williams, remember that bloke? Like where's he now? Kemba Walker. Like what? Like, I know there's some injuries involved in some of that stuff, but they're good, 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 useless. And I don't think that happens to Chris Paul because he is in that elite one, one percent territory. But there could be a steep drop off at any point, and we'll see. The next one is another younger versus old, older player. Not that Nikola Vucevic is particularly old, but at pick twenty-seven, if Cade Cunningham's on the board, if Nikola Vucevic is on the board, Dan, you're uh, you're going to take the big fella in Chicago. I am taking the big fella here. I don't. I don't feel like I need to uh, put as many disclaimers on this one because Vooch isn't uh, nearly as old as Chris Paul. No, he's like um, thirty-two. I, I like uh, thirty-two. Is that what you said? Yeah, he's about to turn thirty-two in like a month. Yeah, that's not too bad. I'm. I'm not too worried about that. I don't think we're. I don't think we have a cliff coming for Vooch. I felt like last year was almost as bad as it could have gone for him. He shot horribly for almost the whole season. It started to inch back up towards the end, and he was at twenty-nine on a per-game basis. He's also played the vast majority of his team's games the last four years in a row, which, again, injuries do happen, but there is some correlation between a guy who tends to play through some of the smaller stuff, and he's shown himself a a willingness to do that. Um, So I think he's this rare instance of a guy who has a little bit of an old man appeal to him, but actually does have the upside that you were talking about that some of the older type guys don't, meaning we've actually seen him shoot the ball better than he did last year. We've, we've seen him be an improved version of whatever last season was. So if last year was the anomaly and percentages come back for him and even everything else just kind of stays the same, the percentages was, would bring more threes and points along with them. And so you could see a three or four category bounce for Vooch. Uh, to me, this one just feels like a guy who will easily – surpass where he's at in ADP and there's room to grow beyond that despite his age. And yeah, I'm not going to argue he's the more exciting of these two picks, <laughs> but like not, not by a, a long shot. Um, to me, Cade is probably taking a jump from, he was about 90 per game last year in nine cat. He probably jumps about three, three and a half rounds. So still a really nice leap forward. Um, but I don't think he catches up with Vooch just yet. Um, okay. Vooch is a solid center, like a, Made the All-Star game, not really a, you know, a guy you'd think of as a, as a long-term All-Star. And what happened last season with his shooting, 31% from three. I would suggest that the year before was the outlier season where he shot 40% because he'd never shot above 36% in any other season prior to that. So while we might look at it as bouncing back, maybe it doesn't. Like He the, he had that one season of really good three-point shooting. He was he finished at the rim at a similar rate, if not better. Well, it actually was better than the year before. His mid-ranges were about the same. It was just the three-point percentage that changed between the two seasons. He suffered a big drop in usage, and I don't think that's changing in Chicago this year. And for these guys, like the names that I mentioned, like Paul Millsap, who was really good until he hit like 32 and then fell away. And he's the same sort of level all-star player to me that maybe at this point, he just falls off. Like, and that that three-point shooting doesn't return and the usage, I don't think, is going to come back. As for Cade, I do not care a single bit at all about turnovers, as I've mentioned. People <laughs> listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you're getting assists, you're generally going to get turnovers. That's how they work. It's the most highly correlated pair of stats in all of fantasy basketball. They are so tightly correlated that if I'm getting assists, which Cade gives me, I know the turnovers are bad. That's just how it works. 
really hard to be elite in both of those things, almost impossible, in fact. And I think Cade, who over you know, the last three months of the season or two months of the season was flying, putting up big numbers, and we see big st- big steps forward. And it could be it could completely blow up in my face, but I'm okay with him in round three, even um, the back ends of round two, maybe, maybe not. Um because that points and assists are hard to find. I think he's a good three-point shooter. He's a good rebounder. He gets steals as well. You just have to brace for the uh, the lack of um, shooting efficiency at times from uh, from Cade. I think we could end up both being right on this one, actually, where if Cade has giant numbers and four turnovers a game, he ends up at like, what are we, 27 you had yeah. there on the board? Yeah. So he could very easily be 27 eight cat and Vooch could very easily be 27 nine cat. Don't you think? Yep. Yep. That's, that's totally possible. Like I don't think Vooch is going to be a 20 point per game scorer, but he might be 17 and nine or something. Um, yeah. He might block 1.2 shots, but yeah, it's that, that efficiency, which he struggled at um, in big chunks. And so did Cade, obviously we'll see how that goes. Next one is again, you, you, we, you came on this podcast earlier in the end and talked about um, Brandon Clark. So we're going to do it again at pick 77. It's Brandon Clark. And it's Alperen Shingun. Now, Shingun's, depending on your draft, he sometimes goes at 50, sometimes he goes at 90, sometimes he's at 80. He's all over the place. Clark is often available here, but I've seen him go earlier than this in drafts as well as people really tie into it. Now, at 77, I'd take Shingun every day of the week over Brandon Clark. I know that he's going to start. I know that he's going to play strong minutes. And if the foul trouble improves, which is a, as a general rule, it's improved significantly from year one to year two through, from players. There's 31, 32 minutes there for him. Dirk Favors isn't taking those minutes. As for Brandon Clark, Dan, I, I don't think he's starting when Jaron's out. I, that's the word I hear from Grizzlies people. He didn't start their preseason game. It was Santi Aldama who started. And we just don't know when Jaron comes back. Now, I expect Jaron back in January. But what if he's back in November? It, how does that impact your valuation of Clark? Yeah, this one this one's a tough one. I I think when we were going through the the board to try to figure out where the pieces would fit for a good battle, this was an interesting one because I had Shengun just a little bit behind this and I've Clark right around there. So it wasn't this a big gap. And then also there's the gap of where they're actually going. Like you said, Shengun's going probably two rounds ish before this. So you're generally not going to be presented with this exact fight on draft night That's where true. like your pick comes up at 70 you're probably going to take Shingun because there's a better chance that Clark gets back to you. And hopefully you then can get both of the guys that you want in that spot. Uh, but again, you know, this comes down to the the Roto side of things for me. I, I love what Brandon Clark can do to elevate field goal percent over a long term. Uh, I love that he's not going to add turnovers to the mix where if I have guys early on that have added a bunch, and I know I've already preached Halliburton and Chris Paul who are going to be like the only guys out there that probably don't have the assist to turnover correlation that's, on the board. That's literally uh, it, basically. Or apart yeah, from uh, the, the Jones brothers. So if you have those two guys, you probably don't need Brandon Clark's low turnovers. So again, there is that team build element that that's a part of it. But like if you have Cade in the third or fourth round, Clark would be a really interesting pair if you're still trying to win turnovers because he balances a lot of stuff that Cade doesn't bring. More defensive stats. Cade's actually not bad at that, by the way. But Clark gets you steals and blocks some rebounds, some field goal percent. And I'm actually not that worried that he falls off completely when JJJ comes back. Uh, They've had a thinning of the herd a little bit in in Grizzly Town regardless. Uh, And Clark looked really good for long stretches last year. So um, again, look at the way your team's built. If you have a bunch of turnover guys, I love Brandon Clark at this spot. Um, If you think your next pick comes back, I I can't do the math in my head. Where would your... Next pick be if you had pick seventy four. Oh, I actually don't care. Or seventy seven. I, I, I got no idea, and I'm not. I'm not about to figure it out. Like, maybe, maybe in the nineties. I don't know. It's somewhere. yeah. It's like fifteen later. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you can go Shengun there and try to get Clark at the beginning of the nineties if possible. But yeah, I'll go Brandon and Roto here because uh, I really like the things he can elevate. I was, but I'm not anti Shengun. I feel no, like I need to. I'm not anti. To... I'm not anti Clark either. Well, I just yeah. I'm, I'm souring a little bit on me because I just thought maybe there'd be some 26, 27 minute upside early in the season, and now I'm not. I'm not so sure. I think, yeah, some people with saying LaRavia might start or Roddy might start. And I think it's, I think now, I think Aldama is going to be their starter and might play 26 minutes. But it means that instead of Aldama playing 18 minutes off the bench and Clark playing 28 as a starter, then maybe it's like 24 apiece or 25, 23 or something like that, which puts a little bit of a cap on that upside where you really want him to, to churn through some numbers early on um, because it is, it is going to drop a little bit as, um, Right. As the season goes on, as Jaron comes back. But look, if Jaron's not back till January, then the value elevates more. If he ama- amazingly you know, shocks us and appears October 30th, 
then we'll go, oh, okay, so we got two weeks of yeah. that. That, <laughs> that would boost. be disappointing. And that's 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 the risk there for me with that one. Now, this next one, I'm, I'm excited to fight you on this next one here, Danny, because we're at pick 30, and I, I know exactly what your argument is going to be. We're at pick 30. It's Ja Morant. He's available in some spots. In some, he's not because he goes too high in a lot of leagues. But in others, he does fall, depending on the competitiveness of the league. And then Mikael Bridges is there. And you, amazingly, astonishingly, not astonishingly because I know who you are, you're, you'd take Mikael Bridges over Ja Morant. And I know the reasons, but tell people what the reasons are. I thought you might slip in the one battle here where I actually had the younger guy a tiny bit higher. I don't remember <laughs> who that was. Was it Keldon Johnson? Is I, that the one where I had a I think slightly it, higher? I think it might have been, yeah. But I, I just I, I got to yeah. keep you on brand, Dan. The people must know there was a young guy that I had a tiny uh, bit higher. Bridges isn't an old guy, though. Was he 25, 26? No, he's not. He's young. And that's actually part of the reason why I'm a big Mikhail Bridges fan is that the, some of the stuff going on with him and, again, yeah, the, the Phoenix vibe stuff. So I got two sons on this board, and I'm feeling worse and worse about all of them as it happens. This is an absolutely insane thing that I'm saying in this battle, but, damn it, I got to go with it because that's the side I'm on here. Um one of these guys is infinitely more exciting than the other. One of them could lead the league in scoring, uh, but uh, one of them can jump out of the roof of the building and then land back down, bend his knee in all sorts of directions, and hopefully come back like two weeks later. Uh, and that's not the guy that I'm drafting for some reason here um, because Bridges has been a pillar of reliability for multiple seasons in a row now. I, I love his game. I love his roto game. He's not a guy that I'm worried about. The departure of Jay Crowder only helps him a little bit more. And it's possible that the vibe stuff might actually help a guy like Bridges who did kind of get iced out on shots at times. Perhaps it opens a door for him to do a little bit more. Uh, but this is a guy that gets to this spot almost exclusively because his body can withstand an NBA season as well as anybody's that I think we've ever seen. And yes, that also means that perhaps he's due for some kind of injury, but dude hasn't missed a game in like pre COVID at this point. So give me the guy that's out there all the time. Um, but obviously you don't have to take him at 30 no. also, you yeah. know, that's yeah. Like I would have taken Chris Paul here. <laughs> you don't, you don't have to take him here, but I think what I wanted to highlight here is that, um, yeah, look, Bridges hasn't missed games. That's true. But Russell Westbrook didn't miss games. Um, yeah, uh, Brooke Lopez, played every single game for three years to start his career. Um, there are plenty of... Damian Lillard, remember how many games he, miss, he used to miss, Dan? Like, none. And then something happens, and then you're hurt. And then it's, it's again, part of my drafting strategy. Is like, if the value of Bridges is based on him not missing games, if he does, then, uh-oh, like, the value's gone. How do you get better than 82 games? How do you produce more than that? I don't, I don't see how you do it. And he's not actually... And, again, I, I do, when I'm drafting in head-to-head, -head, like to attack... Uh, or like to draft for strengths. What's Bridges' strength apart from games played? Like, I, legitimate yeah, question. Like percentages what? again. Yeah, he's and he did it. I think he shot sixty-five or sixty-four percent from two last year, which is an astonishing number. That is for a even for a center, that is a crazy number. For a wing, it's absolutely unheard of. What if he becomes from elite? I've never heard of this number before to very good and hit fifty-eight percent or fifty-six percent of his twos, which is still a great number. That is a huge, huge hit. He's doing it at such an outlier level in games played and in two-point percentage that I don't see how there's any room for that to improve whatsoever. Like if he just gets, yeah. if he like randomly goes to grab a rebound, Chris Paul throws the ball, his head too hard and it breaks his thumb. <laughs> what are you going to do? Like he's out four weeks and, and that's nothing to do with being the toughing stuff out or it just, shit just happens sometimes. And that's sort of like, where is the actual upside value in, in Bridges when he doesn't have a massive strength that's just solid across the board and the upside of him. And look, don't get me wrong. I'm shit scared of Jar, who had three separate knee injuries last season and another one in his first year in the career on the same knee. Oh, that is that is absolutely shit scary to me. And I, I really worry about his knee and his health, but that doesn't preclude someone else from then developing an, an injury problem. So again, um, what's the upside on Bridges? Yeah, this is probably the hardest one for me to argue of the five so far because they are going so far apart in actual drafts where Jaws going at, what is he going at, like 18, 19 right now? And Let me have a look. 60. It's like, it's like a three and a half round gap. Bridges has uh, been bumped up to like in the Yahoo X ranks at like 54 or something. So he has come yeah. up a little bit. Jar is going at 
uh, 19 at the moment. But I've seen him go in the 30s in, in plenty of drafts. But again, it's it's more just us comparing like these two, if, if they were available, right. how you would value them. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this one it does... I, I hate to split hairs on it because it makes for really bad television. But, like, if, if Jaws there in the early 30s and Bridges is there in the early... Which he will be. Mikel's not going at that point. Uh, you don't take the guy who's probably going to be there for two more rounds. No. So, at the end of the year, if I... Just because I think Bridges in 9-cat probably finishes with a higher totals ranking than John Morant does, that's not necessarily the order I'm going to draft them in. That's something that you start to do maybe more towards... I don't know, pick 60 because the board doesn't know anything and people are going to grab guys from all over. See, there's no, you can't track what everybody's going to do at that point. You can track pretty much what your draft is going to do for the first 40 picks or so, you know, the exact order, but you pretty much know the first 40 guys that are coming off the board. And so then you draft based on who's getting back to you. Until until someone loses their mind, like in a draft I was uh, looking at yesterday when they took Paula Paula Bancaro in round three and I went, all right. So uh, yeah, there you go. There's, there's, <laughs> well, at least there's, you know you're gonna beat that team. There's always something going on. Um, Dan, <laughs> that brings us to the end of our ADP battles. Ooh. So thank you for chatting there. And again, it's not about saying, "Oh, Dan, you you don't know what you're talking about," or Josh, why are you just going for these guys who have got risk and upside? Like it's just about, hey, these are why we think these guys are here. These are our arguments. And as you said, game cap format or, or league format, um, team build, what you've done in previous picks, how you're gonna attack it. It all depends. And I say it all the time on my show, Dan, is that a guy that gets picked at 50 or a guy that goes at 80, the difference between them is like, maybe it's one shot attempt per game. If they hit you know, 20 points or 18 points, or they get one steal or 1.3 steals, like it's so small. And that just vaults players up and down. The striation of rankings, um, it's it's really tightly packed in those areas. And you know, just small, small changes make big differences to players' overall perceived value. And I think that we we tie ourselves, well, this guy's 60th and this guy's 65th, so you've got to take the 60 guy first all the time. That's just not how it works. Yeah, um, and they're the same. You have to be a nimble fantasy manager and make those adjustments because you know, sometimes you go, oh, shit, like, I, I really need assists here. This bloke's 80th, but who else am I getting that's giving me seven assists? Shout out to D'Angelo Russell. I might need to grab him. I might need to go 20 spots too early, and that's fine. If he goes from a 72% guy making these numbers up from the line and he shoots 76%, not a big deal, not a big difference, then then he has jumped 20 spots. So just Yeah, I would even tell people that. that like this is probably as aggressive at a year as I've ever been in drafts. I know we talked a lot about old versus young on this show, but in general, I, I think that the draft goes in a thousand directions at about pick like Chris Middleton, wherever uh, the hell he goes. Uh, it's at- weird, yeah. Yeah, right after him, it's just like, oh, anybody's going to go whenever. So at that point, take who you like. I I generally haven't subscribed to that in the past, but the board has created this weird, like, 45 to 65 pocket of nonsense, and then it's always been nonsense past 65. So the the craziness starts earlier this year. Go nuts, man. Go get your guy. That's that's the – I'm leaning into it this season, and if next year's board is is more like it used to be, then maybe I'll go back to playing it safe for five or six rounds. But this year, really only playing it safe for three or four. No, it is. It's it's weird. And every mock draft I do, I look at my picks in round four, five, seven, eight. I go, what am I doing? Like, what are these picks? Like, nothing makes sense here. I've got doubts on everything. And it's way more pronounced this season than it's been in the past. But I tell you what I don't have a doubt on, Dan, is that you're a legend. And thank you for coming on. <laughs> tell everybody about your podcast, where to find you on the old Twitter, and uh, yeah, anything else that, that, that's happening for you. Ah, the Dan Vespers shill hour. You're too kind and you're going to regret it immediately. So I'm just going to tell people, uh, follow the Twitter handle. I do way too much on social media once the season gets started. At Dan Vespers, it's on the screen. Everything else you can find through there. And, you know, hopefully I don't talk too much for everybody to go listen to this show every once in a while. And you'll be on my show, I think. We're recording later this week, but I think it's probably airing early next week, if I had to guess. So that'll be fun. We got the little podcast crossover going on here. We do. So yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be on your show. I'll be in the guest seat, and I'll be uh, I'll be sitting back and just uh, just just throwing out whatever I've got. I don't know. We'll talk Having about some that. cookie dough. Yeah. I, hey, if I can get those built bar cookie doughs here in time, I, I don't think I will. Unless there's some on the way. Built bar. Have you got some coming? I hope so. I'll be on there to talk with you about that, Dan. Thank you again for jumping on and uh, and chatting about some players with me. Thank you, Josh. And that 
we'll do it for me today. More shows coming. Don't don't worry. There's plenty of stuff coming. There'll be a mock draft coming. It might did it come before this? I don't know. Who knows? I've got so much stuff in the old hopper that there's so many things happening, and the only way to do it and to know that they're coming is to follow Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, and on the old YouTube. You thumb it up. You leave a comment down below. And most importantly, you join the 50,000 people who have subscribed to this channel. That's awesome. Go do it. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.